The plastic enters the chamber here through this double valve pneumatic system that will allow us to load in plastic while the machine is running without leaking any type of vapors. On the back here we have eight mounted magnetrons. Now what is a magnetron? A magnetron is this right here. It's in every microwave oven and it's what actually creates the microwaves. The rest of this the transformers and capacitors are a part of the circuit to turn on the magnetron and create the high voltage necessary. Once the plastics are in this chamber, I turn on a vacuum pump to pump out all of the air, or at least most of it, to the point where there's so little oxygen that there won't be any risk of combustion or dioxins forming here. So once all the oxygen is pumped in, or pumped out, we turn on the magnetrons and then the plastic starts to get heated up by the microwaves because the carbon that's mixed with the plastics ends up forming hot spot nucleation spots that reach thousands of potential degrees Fahrenheit and even over a thousand Celsius so the plastic is in there and then it gets broken down in an oxygen free environment under the process of pyrolysis and what that means is the plastic essentially breaks back down into an essential it's essential building block components which is crude oil and it forms the crude oil vapor so it breaks down to the vapor form of crude oil and that vapor will end up traveling up these pipes and it's going to reach this condensing system here these are two shotgun condensers put in parallel and the condensing system will cool down that vapor and get the liquids out of it and then the liquids are going to come down here fall down boom, where they can be collected, the rest of the vapors that never condense come up here and they come to be collected out here. Now why do some vapors never condense? Well it's simply because once they are liberated from the plastic in solid form, they just are the type of molecules that do not condense easy because they've been broken into such light hydrocarbons. For example, some of the types of things that never condense might be some propylene in there and some uh, butanol in the, that was once in the plastic in a longer form, but it got broken down to the shorter form that only extreme cold temperatures could reduce it back to a liquid. Kind of like liquefied natural gas. So. After the plastic is put in the machine, microwaves hit it, the blades spin the plastic, and then as they keep spinning the plastic, it allows the plastic to keep being agitated and have maximum contact with microwaves, so no just uneven heating happens, and the blades also simultaneously move the plastic down the machine. Once the plastic reaches the end of the machine here, it's going to fall down the chute, but it's no longer plastic by that point. It's been hit by so many microwaves and completely degraded, and all of the oils and energy has been liberated from it, and it's just been reduced to carbon and minerals, and those carbon and minerals come out here, and that's exactly what we're about to collect right now. I'm going to show you from the last run the carbon we got, but the natural gas product ends up coming out. You've seen the oil product. The natural gas product ends up coming out and they could be collected into a bladder or compressed directly into some tanks. I have some modified propane tanks here. And the liquids that come down that chute as we see is raw pyrolysis oil. Essentially crude oil. A big range and mix of a whole bunch of petrochemical products like gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, or maybe some other things in between. So in short this is not ready to put directly into an engine. It needs to be distilled and refined. In this bladder here is our natural gas product that we made from the machine. So now, on, the truth is on a chemical level, this is not natural gas at all because it's pretty much doesn't have any methane in it because plastic is not, does not contain methane. But the reason I say natural gas is because when it comes to how it burns the venturi, it's very similar to natural gas. It likes a bigger, uh, a bigger hole. Unlike propane, propane likes a much smaller hole to properly burn. This will blow itself out pretty easily. So how it burns is very similar to natural gas, but it, it's really composed of a ton of different types of molecules, and ultimately we need to do direct testing. But that's why I call it natural gas, but really we, I guess we should start to call it unnatural gas, right? Anyways, I take this and I compress this into some modified propane tanks here, so let's do that. So let's just see this natural gas product before we compress it, how it looks, how it burns, etc. Do you see right off the bladder, pretty clean flame, smokeless, and um, yeah, cool. So I hook up the sucking side to the t big bladder, I hook up the push side to the propane tank, and now let's go ahead and turn this on and get this into the propane tank. We only will be able to compress about half of it into the propane tank because my pump is not strong enough to go above about 150 PSI.
So let's take a look at this natural gas flame. I got a little burner here. I got my mask on because I don't know why I pulled a vacuum on this machine not a full vacuum but negative pressure before I opened it that's why you heard that sound when I opened I don't know why there's so many vapors still in there definitely got to get a stronger pump but look at all the oils that I collected at the front here that just dropped out Goodness gracious. And look at the amount of carbon in there. There's still vapors. I, like I said, I, that kind of is shocking to me. So, um, let's, I got to get up all this oil. Down here, as you see, that's actually water dripping out of this carbon spout. I know why this is happening. The last run I did, I accidentally left my top valve open. So when I opened my top air, air pneumatic valve, it had rained and a ton of rainwater fell in the machine. I've actually never had liquids come out of this port before. So this normally won't happen. But the question is, how can I prevent this from happening if something like water gets in there again? Because I obviously don't want my carbon products mixed with moisture. So with water being dense, the bottom was the only part of this carbon that was soaked, but it was absolutely saturated and soaked with water. The top, all of this is completely bone dry. Now I think the best solution to this and that problem we had when we opened it up and their oil is falling out is we need just need the this end of the machine to get hotter. Hot enough to where it will evaporate the water and evaporate those oils and send them through the, the condensing pipe. Right now, or the la last run rather, there was literally only one magnetron on at this end. So this end was literally just getting a third of the power um, compared to in the middle. And the beginning only had one magnetron on as well. So this is why it's so important for me to have the even distribution of power, 333 all the way down, for reasons like this. Because, especially at the end, it's so important because we don't want this carbon product to be mixed with any type of oils or water. But let me tell you guys, normally when I open up the reactor, some oils always come out, but you know, oils are not as dense as water. So the oils never make their way down and trickle down into the carbon at the bottom. They're literally just at the top of the machine. So the good carbon we collected here, as you see, is pretty uniform. There are some chunks, and those chunks can be dependent on the material. I will be, admit this run was not pure plastic. I did have some other things in there. Um, the chunks can also be clumps of plastic, too, that have not broken down yet. Um, you know, all these things are variable. Most, this is why it's most important to have full power going into the machine to be sure that while the carbon reaches the end of the machine, it's been completely broken down. So that way there's no issues when it comes to things like this. So this is the carbon we want. We, don't, we never want any type of moisture in it, whether that's oil or water, because that means that there's gonna be other things absorbed into the carbon. We want it dry and dusty just like this. And mind you, like I said, this is not a run with just pure plastic. Any minerals come out too. So you see this, for example? This is a steel washer. 
right? So all these minerals and metals that come out obviously have value as well. The carbon, once cleaned up and purified, really can be used for literally anything carbon's used for, including making lab diamonds. Last thing I want to mention, when I was building these blades, I was obviously showing everything, the whole process online, and so many people were worried when I first made them like, oh, it's metal to metal, metal to metal, it's going to scratch, it's going to cut. Well, this is what I was telling you guys this whole time. Look at this machine. The entire inside of the machine of its entirety is covered in pretty much a permanent layer of carbon and oil that literally just does not come off. It's thick and it's permanent. It covers every surface, even the surface of the blades. So everything in this machine is uncoated, but you don't see a speck of rust anywhere despite us dealing with, with, with obviously water and also some very corrosive environments. And that's because this layer of oil and carbon is pretty much like a cast iron skillet. It's like a seasoned cast iron skillet. It gets baked into the surface and it does not come out. So even when I take those blades out, I literally have to take a grinder to grind off that carbon and oil finish in order to be able to weld it. So it's not metal to metal. It obviously self lubricates with the oil and uh, there's no scratching. I, I've had my Mark IV reactor with the blades run for probably over a hundred runs. Never had metal thinning problems because literally it lines itself, it lubricates itself. On a sadder note of things, I went to spin the blades, right? Um, by the way, I'll, let me show you guys the blades closer. So I went to spin these blades on the inside that, you know, spin the carbon down to begin with while the machine's running. And unfortunately, there's still a chunk of, I guess, some semi-solid molten plastic back further in the machine somewhere. And it caused the blades to have too much torque and to contort on themselves completely. Now that normally would never happen with just carbon in there, but if there's plastic that is still in there, um, and you can actually kind of see a chunk of plastic glued to the blades there, it will do that. So now this is going to be an extensive hell of a repair I have to do. I have to take these blades out completely with all this dirt and oil and carbon on them, get it all over the ground, take them out, figure out wherever it got contorted. I hope it's not uh, the whole s section of blades, but however many blades, individual blades are contorted, they have to be cut out and new blades welded in to replace those contorted blades. Of course, the best solution to this is to have um, thicker steel blades. Unfortunately, with my position when I made these blades, that was the only real steel I had, some thin sheet metal. So the best solution other than that is to make sure I only spin the blades when it's only just carbon. But how can you know, right? So got to do that extensive hell of a repair. I guess I'll record it so you guys can see what I got to go through when I'm not live streaming and having fun with it.